Good morning. We'll get started. I'm Rachel Smolkin. I'm the managing editor for news at Politico. We're very happy to have you here and very excited about the next panel on Second Act. I'm here with a, an incredibly diverse group of women who have reinvented themselves and their careers through their tenacity and perseverance. Uh, Rohini Day next to me has a master's in economics and a doctorate in management science. She left a lucrative career as a consultant with World Bank and McKinsey to pursue a passion for Indian cuisine and food, starting a restaurant. She is now a burgeoning restauranteur and philanthropist. She opened the Vermilion Restaurant in Chicago and Manhattan and is also an avid supporter of women in the food industry. Jane Harmon spent nine terms in Congress, rising in the ranks of the nation's leading security and intelligence policy experts. She left Congress at what some may think was the height of her career to take the helm of the Woodrow Wilson Center as its first female director, president, and CEO. Maria Pinto designed fashions for Michelle Obama and Oprah Winfrey, and after closing her first boutiques, relaunched her latest brand, M2057, with a popular campaign on Kickstarter. And Congresswoman Jackie Speer has had a storied career in her path to Capitol Hill. She's faced personal tragedies, experienced professional setbacks and losses, and has risen above all of that to shape her agenda in Congress and become a valued leader in the Democratic Party. So let's get right to the conversation. And this is all about second acts. How do you renew? How do you start over, whether the impetus is tragedy or economic necessity or simply boredom. Is a second act a, a path of self-discovery? And how do you know the timing is right? Rohini, why don't you get us started? Rachel, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> They're going to kick us off in half an hour. <laughs> that's, a, that's a weighty question. Uh, in my case, I grew up in India. And since the age of 12, my dream was clearly to save the world. <laughs> At the age of 12, I remember in my school uniform crossing the street, going to the World Bank office on a dusty, hot summer day in New Delhi and asking them, how do I get a job with you? <laughs> Much laughter and derision, and they said, go get a PhD and come back, which is what I did. <laughs> From save the world to upscale dining, it baffles me. <laughs> but it's been many a twist and turn and with McKinsey in the middle. And the last rung was a combination of, I would say, passion. Loved dining out, was on the road, ample with, with a nice uh, expense account. Um, traveled tremendously. The world was booming when it com came to food. Still is. There's no, it's just not declining. And a uh, combination of wanting to go entrepreneurial. And finally, it was rage. I was furious at the Indian options out there. The curry in a hurry, all you can eat, $8.99, you can predict the menu with 100% certainty. Come on, you know, this is the oldest civilization since the Indus Valley, and the complexity is tremendous. So surely we can do what Nobu has done for Japanese or uh, uh, others have done for Korean or, and, and, and now French, Italian and all are pedestrians. So this is what drove me to take the plunge from the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> <laughs> Congresswoman. Well, I already wear her clothes, and now I'm going to your restaurant. <laughs> it will be a full guys. service panel. Let's yes. support our sisters. Uh, so I think it's a couple things. Uh, it is about early dreams. That's my story, too. I grew up in Los Angeles, public high school kid, early boyfriend, went to the Democratic Convention in L.A. in 1960, the age of your great-grandmothers, and uh, was there on the floor of the convention when John Kennedy was nominated for president. And my personal light bulb went off, and I just knew I wanted a career in politics. It took me 32 years to run for Congress. The first elected office I sought 
since junior high school treasurer, which I lost. But <laughs> I've, had, I've, I've had at least three careers already because I was a congressional aide for a long time. I worked in the Carter White House. I was in private law practice, which was, for me, really boring. Um, then I ran for Congress, served for nine terms, left after my third term, actually, to run for governor of California, which I lost, got talked into coming back to Congress, served another uh, five terms, and then left because the opportunity to be CEO of the Wilson Center was absolutely enormous. Uh, I succeeded uh, Lee Hamilton. Many of you may know him, a very uh, well-regarded former member of Congress himself. And it's extraordinary. It's a big international stage, and I'm very interested in international issues. Uh, the only other thing I'd say about all this is uh, I see life as a journey. Uh, there are many stops on the way. Uh, where you go with this journey is up to you. Uh, you can't buy it. Your mother can't give it to you. Uh, your kids, and I have four of them, can certainly uh, inspire you. And grandkids are much better than kids, by the way. Uh, but but you've got to go there. And you've got to have the passion and drive to go. And so this may be my mm, fourth or fifth career. I'm planning on at least five more. <laughs> That's wonderful. Maria. Um, well, first I want to challenge the word um, reinvention. I think it's really more about evolution, and I like your perspective in terms of it's a journey. And I'm, I think that my career has just been an evolving process of what we learn and what we bring to the table today. So as a designer today, I can embrace things in a much different way, both as a designer and as a woman, and looking around in this room and saying, what do we need, and uh, which brings more relevance to what I'm what, what I would consider doing now. Um, so that, that's my first challenge, because I don't, I, for some reason I always get twitchy when I hear reinvention, because it feels like you're doing something to fix something, as opposed to building on something that you've already you know, invested so much of your life into. And to your point, it always goes back to passion and drive. I've always wanted to design, and I've had probably four or five lives already. How many lives does a cat have? I guess I have a few left. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, you've got at least double the number to go still. Exactly. Then, right? Yeah. Congresswoman Sphere. So I think the first thing I would say is throw out the plan. Because it's not going to go the way you expect it to go anyway. So no need to waste any time thinking about what your future is going to look like. Um, much like uh, Jane, I have had um, uh, many losses. I am what I like to say a three-time loser. I lost for student body president in high school. I lost the first time I ran for Congress in 1979. And I lost when I ran for lieutenant governor of California in 2006 when I thought I was going to be the first woman uh, to serve in that role. But every time I lost, I found out that I had really won because it set me up to do something even more extraordinary than I thought I was going to be able to do. So I would say that uh, there's not just a second act, there are many, many acts. And do not confine yourself into thinking that uh, if you do, if you, you have to find out what the perfect job is for you. Because there are going to be many perfect jobs, and that imperfect job, the job that you hate, is going to teach you so much about what you really want. I think that's a, a great way to put it. And I want to go back to a point that Congresswoman Harmon made. I like the concept of a journey. How do you know, though, when it's time to take the journey? When, when you stand in place for a while and when you take that next step? Are you asking me? I am. Uh, well, um, everybody in this room needs to be fierce. Do we understand this? Uh, <laughs> you need to fight for what you want. There are different ways to fight. Fight doesn't always mean you know kicking somebody in the face. It can be... A, a kinder, gentler, even more effective way to get what you want. But you, you, Jackie's right. I mean, <clears throat> failure is your friend. I failed a number of times professionally. I also had personal loss, uh, which Jackie has had too, and maybe others of you have. But right after I took the Wilson job, nine days in, this was two and a half years ago, my husband was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. Don't get that. I don't recommend it. And died in a month. And it was just brutal. Uh, but I kept going. And so it is, it is way, I, you know when the time is when you, when you know. I mean, I don't know how to say that. I think it is true that uh, being in the wrong job can teach you what, you what you don't like. And being in the wrong job sometimes is useful to prove yourself to get a better job. Um, but 
I'm looking around this room is be fearless. Do it. Think about what you really, really want to do. If you don't like what you're doing, uh, check out other things. One, one other uh, piece of advice, which you probably know, it's much easier to get a job from a job. Don't just quit and then sit, in your, sit on your bed and say, I need a job. <laughs> Somebody do something. Doesn't work like that. And you will have to, you know, sometimes bide your time. And especially if you're raising a family, sometimes you have to bide your time. I don't mean quit again, but it's hard. Uh, when I had four kids at home, it was uh, a really hard thing to juggle all this. And when I ran, finally ran for Congress, two of them had already, uh, uh, one was in college and one was on a uh, school year abroad program. So it was more manageable. But just one last point about this, uh, just the, the life balance uh, the work balance thing. I one night called home to tell my then nine-year-old daughter, my youngest, who's now 29, uh, she, she, she survived me. She's not a drug dealer. She's very happy and beautiful. But I said, Justine, I can't come home to put you to bed because I have to stay late to vote. Her immediate comment was, Mommy, why is staying late to vote more important than coming home and putting me to bed? Okay. And what did you say? There is no an I haven't answered that question 20 years later. If anyone knows the answer, I'd be interested. <laughs> Can I just suggest something about that, though? Um, all of you, at probably one point or another in your life, um, want to have a family. Um, it took me um, a long time to have my first child. I was 38 years old, and then had a couple of miscarriages, uh, one at 17 weeks. Mm -hmm. And it was um, very tough. And then we adopted a baby. And then the birth mother, 10 days later, took the baby away. And I'm crying, coming home and saying to my husband, why do these bad things keep happening to us? And he said, now wait a minute. We have this beautiful son. We have each other. We have our health. And we can try again. So I go to the fertility specialist who says to me in the most unkind way, um, based on the age of your eggs and <laughs> your medical history, you have about a 10% chance of getting pregnant with in vitro. Well, that sounded like um, bad odds. So we closed that chapter, grateful to have our son. I started running statewide for Secretary of State. And then that time of the month came and went and came and went and came and went. And I finally, at 11 o'clock at night, run out to Walgreens to get the home pregnancy test, come back, take it. My God, it's turning the right color for the first time after doing it hundreds of times. I call my husband, who is an ER doc, and say, honey, I, I think I'm pregnant. He says, what was it, immaculate conception? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and sure enough, um, he says, come down to the hospital. He was an ER doc. Come down to the hospital, and let's get a blood test. Go down to the hospital, get the blood test. Calls me um, at 7 a.m. in the morning. He says, you know, you are pregnant. So I got pregnant naturally at 43. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, don't give up hope. I'm, the, the sad part of, of that particular story was that um, two weeks later I announced I wasn't running for Secretary of State any longer because it was a very high risk pregnancy because of my two um, miscarriages before. And then two weeks later my husband was killed in an automobile accident. Uh, and I was then a, a single parent with a five and a half year old, a widow pregnant with our second child, and my husband, who was a, a remarkable guy, but he was an ER doc, and they live in the moment, uh, let his life insurance lapse, so I was three months from personal bankruptcy. And, and look, how do you and go look at on now. I mean, we're talking about second yeah. acts. You had <laughs> third, fourth, and fifth acts. How, how do you take that next step? Is there any... So, I, you know, I frankly wanted to die. And I think that, you know, I would s sit in... Uh, it was a high-risk pregnancy, so I was at bed rest for a, a good part of it. And I remember my dad, who was, you know, this big Germanic guy, coming to visit me one day. And I said, you know, Dad, I just don't know if I can go on with this. I, I miss Steve so much. It, and I just, you know, this pregnancy. And he looked at me. He said, Jackie, it's been three months. Get over it. Mm. Tough words. Yeah. But in part, that's what we have to do. Whatever it is that comes our way that is painful and traumatic, um, we, we've got to kind of get the wherewithal internally and surround ourselves with family and friends to help us get through yes. those dark times. And yes. you have to be willing to ask for what you want. 
you know, after losing my husband, it was, it was tough and people didn't want to hear me talking about it three years later, but I was still in a lot of pain. Um, but I found ways of, you know, creating a universe of people around me um, who were of like mind. We called ourselves the Merry Widows and no one wanted to join that club. Um, and that built a friendship of women who even today, um, get together three or four times a year to support each other. So develop that, that universe of people to, to help you. Rachel, I'd like to add to your question about Please. the timing. I know, I mean, it's... Because you were not in a situation right. where circumstances had imposed a change on you. You were at a job, earning a lot of yeah. money in a high-profile position. Why make that change? Should people think you were, were crazy to do it? I want to write a book on this. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, it is. I mean, it's ridiculous, especially when you come from an Indian background and you've invested in a PhD and brand name careers to go from that to a small business of, of all of those restaurants is, is appalling. I think my parents are still hoping I'll come back to sanity. <laughs> but, uh, and my in-laws even more but so. But they eaten at your restaurant. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, we all... I'd worked at McKinsey. I'd worked with countries at the World Bank. I'd worked with Fortune 100 at McKinsey. And so you think you're smart. Right? And uh, I'd eaten out a lot, so that makes me a connoisseur, right? <laughs> Man, was I in for a journey. I really, and, but, but what I would counsel to anyone who's looking to grow, and for me, there are, there are people who live in different ways, and I thrive outside my comfort zone. Exactly. I get my wow. energy from that, exactly. from the, a little bit of insecurity and fear and push. And, and so for me, I didn't just quit McKinsey and say, all right, this is it. I took a leave of absence. I took a couple of months to really invest in myself. I, we call it early immersion. We used to do it even at McKinsey. I spoke to 40 different people who would speak to me, owners, operators, managers. I went and lived with the rest of the year. I did the numbers inside out. I spoke to bankers. I ran my business plan. I wanted to convince myself, is this viable conceptually and financially. It's not philanthropy. I'm not throwing away a career for just ego or to build myself a Taj Mahal, if you will, you know? And it's only after I did those two months, still, it, didn't, it taught me very little. God, I so miss having HR, <laughs> <laughs> IT, legal, travel, corporate. <laughs> One day when I get to that empire, I'll get all of that back. <laughs> but... Um, it's been such an amazing journey, right. hugely gratifying. And I strongly endorse it, not just here, but making that change, whether you call it second act, renewal, evolution, whatever. We'll call it evolution as I go to Maria. <laughs> you were in a position where you had your dream job, everything was going so well, and then because of the economic downturn, you really had to step back and rethink everything. Mm -hmm. How do you not let fear hold you back in a situation like that? Um, I think you hit a point where it just sort of tells you you have to move on. And um, to your point, you surround yourself with really dynamic, strong people that, of course, you don't make any of these major life decisions without um, consulting and gathering information. And um, it's not easy. I mean, not, it's easy to sit here and talk about it. Mm. When you're in that space, that's, it gets very dark and scary, and then you just have to find the, you know, the whatever you want to refer to, whether it's in your soul, your network of friends, you know, there's a the pragmatic side and there's the emotional and spiritual side. It all comes together to move you to the next place. And um, it's absolutely not easy, but I have absolutely no regrets. I think the best thing that ever happened was that I closed my company in 2010, gave me the time to breathe, and, you know, I was able to do consulting work, I was able to gather new information, which is informing what I'm doing now, and it's so much more interesting. It's so much more dynamic. Um, I, I have absolutely no regrets at this point. Did I not have three years of a big roller coaster ride? Absolutely. But, I mean, if I were to advise someone, I would say take the leap, and um, there's always okay. something better on the other side. You don't know what it is, but you have to have faith in, you have to have faith in yourself and courage. And, you know, it's always scary. I mean, when isn't it scary? Look around the room. Come on. Who isn't, yeah. you know, coming here today? There was probably some fear. Like, what's going to happen? Uh, you know, there's always some kind of fear that plays into what we do. So, you know, I don't, I think when you don't have that sense of, of, um, of, 
call it thrill, whatever you want. It's an emotional, you know, kind of drug. And that's what sort of drives you to the next place. And I think people, I live probably on the edge a lot more than most people I know, and they all think I'm a little, they respect me, but at the same time, they know that I'm a little crazy. And, but you have to be, otherwise it's boring. I mean, I have absolutely no regrets. My life has never been boring, um, but it has been definitely scary. But I've had great experiences, just like everyone sitting here. Could I just add one thing that hasn't come up because it matters so much, and that is women supporting women. Uh, a lot of what Jackie's talking about, right. <laughs> is about this network of women's support. And by the way, when my husband died, one of the first people to call me was Jackie. And she sent me this lovely book, and we had breakfast, and we talked about this. What was the book? She, what was the name of the book? Um, this is not the life I ordered. Yeah. Beautiful book, and a beautiful gesture, more important than, than even the book. But not, not all women help women. Thought I'd share this little secret with you. Mm -hmm. uh, as Madeleine Albright says, and boy is she right, there's a cold place in hell for women who don't support women. But all of our careers up here, and a lot of yours, are going to depend on women mentors and, and a women a support group of women, not just your families, although there, there may be strong women in your families. Uh, but uh, not use those support networks, but also do it yourself, pay it forward. It is so important that you become the mentors uh, and, uh, and the people who inspire younger women who are wondering whether they can get out of their comfort zone. I bet there were strong women in your life who maybe didn't do as crazy things as you did, but who maybe in your own family got out of their comfort zones. And you, you, know, you said your parents are probably appalled, but I'm sure there were other people uh, who, who you saw out there, even in India, who were role models for what you, at least the kind of journey you want I, to take. I don't think your role models necessarily have to be women. No. I also don't think your mentors women. necessarily have to be women. I think men can be incredibly helpful, but it's up to us to reach out. But I totally agree with your point about building that network. And, uh, and uh, in, in, in our case, in culinary, I'm glad you brought it up. But, and I was having a conversation with Rachel earlier. Mm -hmm. But the statistics in for leadership of women in culinary, when I talk about leadership, I'm talking about being restaurateurs, restaurant magnates, or lead chefs, not pastry chef, not line, is it makes the Senate look like hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> I, truly, it's, it makes it look fabulous. So in schools, enrollment by women is now a little over 50%. But when it comes to winning awards and being in these lead positions, well below 10%, by any statistics, even as low as 3%. So I'm now uh, 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 on the board of trustees of the James Beard Foundation, which is the Oscars of culinary, and we're making a concerted effort. I've co-founded a scholarship with them to literally build leadership within women. So it's not more education grants, it's not more scholarships. You don't need more education. It's about pulling you out, giving you a one-year accelerated entrepreneurial, unless you can do your finances, you know, a, a, a balance sheet, an invested capital, p &L, talk the language of owners, sourcing, costs, uh, management, and running the entire kitchen, a one-year accelerated training. So we're rolling that out uh, across different chefs and hoping to build a groundswell of change in the industry. Mm -hmm. Why is it important? Not because I want my daughters to be restaurateurs, God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> I, but women need to own half the sky, right? right? Mm -hmm. So why not? I, I want to pick up on uh, Congresswoman Spears' story. You shared some personal tragedy with us, but there was other. Uh, you were shot five times at, Jane, at Jonestown trying to rescue constituents and left for dead. Give us a sense of, again, how you come back from an experience like that. You've talked a lot about surrounding yourselves with good friends, but what do you draw from yourself to, to go forward? I was 28 years old when that happened. I was uh, the legislative uh, counsel to Congressman Leo Ryan, and there was a cult, although it was called a church in San Francisco, called the People's Temple, and 900 members, along with their uh, reverend, Jim Jones, went to South America, to Guyana, to set up um, a commune there. And many of Congressman Ryan's constituents were concerned about their loved ones, young adults often, um, who um, they felt were 
subject to mind control and had, had just cut themselves off from their family. So we made the trip down there. Many people wanted to leave. Uh, on the airstrip, uh, unbeknownst to us, the tractor trailer had followed behind us with seven gunmen on it and um, shot and killed Congressman Ryan. It was shot 45 times. A number of members of the press were on the trip. And I was shot five times on the right side of my body. And I've got to tell you, at 28, thinking, oh my God, this is it. I'm not going to live to be 85. I'm not going to get married and have 2.5 kids. This is it. Um, and when you have moments like that in your life, it kind of puts everything um, in perspective. And I just made a commitment to myself that if I did live, if I did survive, that I would um, never take another day for granted, live every day as fully as possible, and commit myself to public service. So I'm one of those who literally have had a couple of lives and um, am very lucky to be here, as I think we all are. I I think that's a, a wonderful note to close on, and I'm, I'm being given signals that that needs to happen soon. But before we do, uh, Maria, I promised my daughter, who wants to be a fashion designer, that I would ask you a question from her, which is, what will your next line look like, and do you think it will be a big hit? A hundred percent, because how many women are in this room? <laughs> you all promised to go look at my website, M2057 by Maria Pinto. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. And, 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 and so, uh, you said something earlier, and I do appreciate having mentors as ma male, I mean, I have many, and if, if I didn't say I thank them, mentors that have been men and friends that have been men that have supported me. But I do recognize and, and appreciate what you said earlier in terms of uh, women supporting women. And it's our responsibility. Like, I just got off of a call this morning. I squeezed in. I, I launched my new collection on Kickstarter, by the way, which is really a cool platform. It's like fashion meeting, the great world of the web. And this woman emailed me, and she goes, I'm launching a, a project. Can you, can you, do you have time to speak with me? And I've had many of those, and I, I try to respond to all of them because I know that if there's five minutes that I can share yeah. some insight. So it's easy to say it. It's another thing to make the time to do it. And I know it's our responsibility. Did but I answer her question? I'll tell her you gave a fabulous answer. <laughs> that yes, it's going to be a big hit. Well, Why don't I have each of you give me a one-sentence closing thought, anything you wanted to wrap up on or that we didn't get to and you wish we had? Rohini. I'll go last. You'll go I'll last. Go. Okay, Congresswoman. Well, my here. daughter, Justine, the one who I you know, disappointed profoundly 20 years ago, is now the beauty and features editor at L.com. She's my resident fashionista, and she'll be really impressed that I met you. <laughs> uh, um, I just want to thank all of you. Um, it's, you're, you know, I'm always inspired by women that I meet, and I've been lucky to meet these wonderful women on the panel today, and um, thank you for allowing me to be here with you. Thank you. Congresswoman. Well, I, too, am delighted to be with this great panel. I would just like to end with this quote. Life should not be a journey with the intention in arriving in a well-preserved body, but rather <laughs> to be totally used up, totally worn out, chocolate in one hand, martini in the other, <laughs> screaming, yeah. woohoo, yeah. what a ride. <laughs> Okay, Rahini, it's your turn. I've come up with nothing profound, but, uh, <laughs> but who can beat that? <laughs> Except I turned the martini to a rum and coke, <laughs> in my case. But no, again, a pleasure to be here. I really hope all of you pursue your dreams. It is about that. Yep. And as, as long as there's passion, it's, 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 it's worth the ride. And I, I want to thank Politico. What a lovely morning. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. This was a wonderful conversation. We're so happy you could be here.